Oh, hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Freedom Path Lectures Pursue. And as you know, this is Pursue Phase 3. <clears throat> and like previous, uh, all, you, all our uh, lectures, this also is available on YouTube for easy downloadable. And it, you can join our Telegram group, uh, and you, where you can get all the updates on all the lectures which are coming, and also the links of various YouTube activities, lectures, and, and our Google Meet PDFs. You can also access the Google Drive uh, through this link. You also have a master integration key, which is my key, which is easy to navigate all the lectures, the videos, as well as the PDF. And uh, these are the disclaimers. Today uh, we have uh, we are into our second lecture of the phase three, and today we have uh, a lecture in cytology, which is first and T, which is in first phase cytology, and we are streaming from PGI and your Chandigarh. And to talk on today's topic, which is serious fluid cytology, we have the famous doctor Professor Melanie Gupta. She is an MD, DMD, MMA, MMA, MS, MIAC. She is a professor in the Department of Cytology and Gynecological Pathology at the PGI and in Chandigarh with areas of interest in cytopathology, both dialect as well as non dialect also in FNSE, pulmonary pathology, gynecological cytology and histopathology, and also in NBC. She also has cancer research activities with cancer research and biology in cancer cervix, lungs, and endometrial cancers. She has got more than 340 publications in national and international journals with 15 chapters in various, including 10 chapters on your cervical cytology. She was awarded the ICMR International Fellowship for Young Biomedical Scientists in the year 2011. And she's worked in Manchester Cytology Center as well as in the Royal Hampshire Hospital, Sheffield, UK. With this, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Manoli to start her lecture, which is on the serious free cytology, reporting systems, and liquid based cytology. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Various reporting systems and liquid-based cytology in serious. Uh, so when we talk of effusion, it is excess of fluid within some peritoneal cavity or a pleural space. And we know there are two types of uh, effusions, transudate or exudative. Like transudate would be like clear and exudative is more turbid. And it is determined by specific gravity, protein content, fibrin, LDH, and uh, exudative effusions are rich in cells, especially malignant cells. And there are some additional differences like fluid to serum protein ratio, fluid to serum LDH ratio, and cholesterol SARG values and radio density on CT scan can also determine whether it is transudative or effusion, uh, exudative effusion. When it comes to cytologists, the most important thing is how the sample would be collected and submitted to the lab. So sample should be submitted uh, fresh, unfixed, and it should be processed without delay. But if there is delay expected, then it should be refrigerated at 4 degrees centigrade. And uh, most of the times in our center, we use anticoagulants. And the most common anticoagulant used is ammonium oxalate uh, in the ratio of 9 is to 1. EDT and heparin can also be used. And on requisition form, you, in addition to all patient uh, related uh, information like what kind of uh, uh, sample it is at the at what time it has been collected on which date uh, clinical symptoms clinical diagnosis imaging findings any past history and investigation required should be mentioned on the acquisition form and once the sample is received in the uh, lab uh, we must mention uh, the volume of the sample received color and consistency of the sample uh, and we usually centrifuge it uh, uh, on uh, at 2000 rpm for 10 minutes at room temperature and prepare routine site uh, routine smears like mgg and uh, uh, fixed uh, pap stain. If you want to do LBC also, especially for sure path, we use the sediment uh, fluid and add equal amount of um, uh, liquid based uh, like sure path preservative. Keep it for half an hour at, at room temperature and then process it 
with Surepath uh, automated machine. Uh, in addition to preparing smears, we must make cell blocks of uh, these uh, these uh, effusion cytology samples because you can do ICC, you can do molecular testing, you can assess cellularity uh, of tumor cells, which should be at least more than 20, uh, 50 uh, viable cells. And you can extract DNA even from these MGG stained slides. If it is hemorrhagic, you can use uh, uh, glacial acetic acid. And at the time of processing, LPC can take care of hemorrhagic samples, but fishtail smears or buffy coat smears can also be prepared. So what is the advantage of liquid-based cytology over conventional cytology? We have one slide to screen, less area to screen. So the, the productivity of the lab is increased. The most important and uh, I would say the mo most important factor why we convert these effusion samples into uh, LPC is it concentrates your sample, especially hemorrhagic samples and low cellular samples. They work better on LPC and we've seen that around 10 to 15 15% of samples which were reported negative on conventional could be uh, reported as uh, maybe suspicious or malignant on LBC. And from LBC, again, you can make uh, uh, cell blocks, special stains can be done and ICC can be done along with molecular testing. When it comes to cell block, uh, there are different uh, techniques available. Uh, we used to do plasma thrombin, thromboplastin clot method, and now we have shifted to alginate method. And again, cell block can help you uh, do more ICC for future use and reduction of malignancies higher on cell blocks. So what is the approach to effusion cytology? First of all, we should know the clinical history, other lab findings. On cytology, we need to see whether they are just benign cells or there are malignant cells. If it is malignancy, is it adenocarcinoma or something else? And then try to find out the primary site of malignancy by doing ancillary studies. Molecular testing can also be done to find out mutations and um, uh, different fusion uh, products. So when it comes to reporting of effusion cytology, there are uh, two main guidelines which I will discuss. One is international system where they divide the uh, effusion cytology samples into non-diagnostic, negative for malignancy, ATP of undetermined significance, suspicious for malignancy and malignant. And we can see that um, negative for malignancy and uh, non-diagnostic category, they have risk of malignancy almost similar, like 17 and 21 percent, as opposed to ATP or suspicious and malignant, where you can actually differentiate between mesothelioma, adenocarcinoma, and other malignancies in effusion cytology. Similar guidelines uh, came up for, from Indian Academy of Cytology, where uh, cytologists, where I was also part of this, these guidelines, and we also con divided them into these five categories like unsatisfactory, benign, atypical, suspicious, and malignant. And we also saw that our estimated risk of malignancy was almost similar, like with category two, it was 16%. And for ATP, it was 50%, suspicious, it was 95%. And when you say malignant, it is malignant in almost 100% cases. So if we deal all these categories one by one, what is unsatisfactory? If it is um, a sample which is very posicellular or a lot of hemorrhage is there, or there is a lot of obscuration by anticoagulant, it will be unsatisfactory as opposed to negative for malignancy where you do not see any malignant cells. You can have reactive mesothelial cells, inflammatory cells, lymphocyte-rich effusion, or some specific infections like fungal or tubercular or hydrated or other things. So the most common cells which are seen in effusion cytology is mesothelial cells. But the problem with mesothelial cells is that they can attain different type of versions on morphology. So let's see some mesothelial cells. This is short that slide showing a lot of mesothelial cells and some lymphocytes. So most of them are discrete population with some knobby uh, clusters. So this is a knobby cluster and we can see low NC ratio. The cells can have eccentric to centrally placed nuclei, some cleaving can be seen, binucleation can be seen, and some signet ring-like morphology can also be seen in these cells. And this is uh, image taken from DMA where these mesothelial cells, they show some prominence of chromocenters, uh, this kind of peripheral skirting, cytoplasmic blebs, microvilli all over, and signet ring-like appearance. And these are some of the pictures of mesothelial cells clicked by me, again showing peripheral skirting, prominent nuclei, 
skirting with central uh, centrally placed nuclei, some prominent nucleoli, vacuolation, signet ring like morphology, this kind of uh, medusa head like uh, morphology, windows, binucleation, cell in cell, and again signet ring like morphology with cell in cell morphology. So on morphology, we try to differentiate reactive mesothelial cells from malignant cells. Malignant cells are more 3D ball-like clusters. They will they can have some windows, especially lung adenocarcinomas, but vacuolation cell in cell could be more common. Signet rings again can be seen in mesothelial cells, but the chromatin is very important. When you have irregularly clumped chromatin, it is more like malignant cells and nucleoli can be seen both in reactive mesothelial cells and malignant cells. So at times we need to use this IHC to differentiate whether it is just mesothelial cells or malignant cells. And we know mesothelial cells are positive for desmine, CK5 and 6 and calretinin WT1 and T240. Uh, desmine is positive in reactive mesothelial cells as opposed to malignant cells which would be positive for MOC31 and BUR up to uh, BUR up 4 and CEA. What are the other cells which can be seen in effusion? We can have lymphocytes, polymorphs, eosinophils, plasma cells, histiocytes. Sometimes LE cells can be seen or maybe uh, liver cells or squamous cells, fat and pigment can also be seen, especially hemosidral laden macrophages can be seen. And some crystals like charcoal laden crystals in eosinophil rich effusions can be seen. So this is an example of acute inflammation which can be just a pyogenic effusion or biliary peritonitis. But we must do AFB, especially in our uh, country where tuberculosis is very uh, rampant. And some of these acute inflammatory uh, effusions would show AFB positivity. Another uh, presentation of tuberculosis is this, which is lymphocyte-rich effusion with very Occasional mesothelial cells, you can have this kind of thing in low-grade lymphomas also. So based on history and clinical information, sometimes we subject these effusion cytology samples to flow cytometry to see whether it is just reactive or it is a low-grade lymphoma. This is a rare presentation where you start seeing uh, necrotic material and on AFP, you will demonstrate uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is an example of eosinophil rich effusion and when you have more than 10% of eosinophils, we call it eosinophil rich effusion. You can have charcoal laden crystals. The most common cause of eosinophil rich effusion is repeated tapping, pneumothorax, sometimes hemothorax, allergy, uh, hypersensitivity to drugs and parasites can also be there in eosinophil rich effusions. Category 3 is just atypical cells present which could be like uh, some atypical cells which are quantitatively or qualitatively do not favor malignancy or they are not uh, good enough, the number is good no not good enough to call it positive for malignant cells. So the recommendation is you should do, do repeat cytology and correlate clinically with other imaging findings and you can do uh, ancillary techniques as well. So in an effusion sample, if you see just one or two such clusters which look atypical to me, uh, I would say it is category 3 and I'm not sure whether it is just reactive mesothelial cell or a cluster or it is a malignant cluster. So uh, when we say suspicious for malignancy category 4, again, it is quantitatively or qualitatively falling short of frank malignancy and we call it suspicious or malignancy and sometimes ICC can be useful in this setting. So similar uh, like singly scattered atypical cells or few clusters or atypical cells, some atypical cells which look suspicious but it seems as if maybe these are um, reactive mesothelial cells and then you start seeing this kind of cell in cell morphology. So this could be suspicious for malignant as opposed to category 5 which is unequivocally malignant and we know it is carcinoma or uh, other malignancy. So first of all when we say positive for malignancy it could be carcinoma or non-carcinoma. In carcinoma you can have adenos, squamous or small cell and for uh, 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 adenocarcinoma you need to see morphology, clinical information and cell block and we divide them into like uh, 
by ICC, you can uh, actually uh, interpret whether it is coming from lung, breast, ovary, or other things. These are the immunochemical markers commonly used in effusion cytology. And we know that mesotheliomas would be positive for calretinin, T240, and WT1. And even GATA3 is positive in mesothelioma, but MOC31 would be negative. Small cell carcinoma would be positive for neuroendocrine markers. Formus would be positive for P40 and P63. Lung adenocarcinoma, TTF1, ovary, WT1 and PAX8. Stomach again, you will have CK7 positive T and MOC31 positive T. And for colorectal, we depend on CK7 negative T and CK7 positive. And then sad B2 and CDX2 positive T. And Lymphomas would be L LCA positive and germ cell tumors would be SAL4 positive. So CK7 is not useful to differentiate mesothelioma from adenocarcinoma. Mesothelioma can be GATA3 positive. P40 is a better stain than P63 to demonstrate common cell carcinoma. And we know that small cell carcinomas are positive for TTF1. Similarly, a panel of CK7 and 20 can be used to determine whether it is coming from breast, ovary, cervix, cholangiocarcinoma versus colorectal, which is 20 positive, 7 negative, or both, which could be mucinous tumors or urothelial gastric tumors, and both negative like squamous cell carcinomas, HCC and prostate. So, just trying to show you some examples of different malignancies like this is MGG and this is short path uh, uh, LPC, uh, patient having pleural effusion, chest pain and cough in a 65 male. So, it is clearly adenocarcinoma. What else you will do? You will prepare a cell block, do uh, CK7, CK56 is negative. TTA1 shows nuclear positivity and P40 is also negative. And in addition to that, from the cell block, you can extract DNA and demonstrate EGFR mutations. Nowadays, we do EGFR mutations by real-time PCR by Ariax Max uh, Agilent technology, where we detect all these known mutations, which is like T790M, 19 deletion, and other mutations in exon 18, 19, 20, and 21. This is one such example where you have pleural effusion, which is positive on PET, adenocarcinoma with cell block, and you demonstrate G719X on exon 18 and L858R on exon 21, a mutation which is seen in, uh, which is demonstrated from pleural effusion. And on cell block, you can demonstrate ALK uh, antibody also by D5F3 clone. So most of the times, if EGFR mutations are positive, ALK would be negative because they are mutually exclusive. This is ROS. We do it by D4, uh, D6 clone and TP, uh, uh, TPS score of more than 90% of PDL1 uh, done by SP263 clone. And here, the intensity it does not matter. Like it could be mild staining or, or versus severe, uh, like um, intense staining, but it should be partial to complete membranous staining. Uh, this is another pleural effusion case. Patient is a smoker, and you can see this kind of vertebral bodies, tumor cells, which are smaller than mesothelial cells. They have this kind of salt and pepper type of chromatin, and good molding is seen. So chromatin is seen here, which is salt and typical salt and pepper. You can see mitotic figures and these kind of vertebral bodies or Indian file type pattern. So this is small cell carcinoma. This is the, these all images have been taken from LPC sample and you can see this mo uh, good molding in these tumor cells. What else you can do? Prepare a cell block and demonstrate neuroendocrine markers. TTF1 is positive, synaptopycin. CD56 and NSC is positive in this. Um, sometimes you see uh, metastatic squamous cell carcinoma also. This is P63 positive in pleural effusion. Uh, 43, 45 male pleural effusion. And we can see this discrete population of tumor cells which are showing this kind of irregular nuclear membranes, irregularly distributed chromatin and prominent nucleoli. So this was actually stomach primary with signet ring cell morphology. And uh, this is another one, uh, uh, an, uh, a metastatic carcinoma, which is CK7 positive, GATA3 positive. And even th these known cases of uh, CA breast, 
Sometimes they come for ERPR and HER2 staining on effusion cytology. And this is another uh, female patient with pleural effusion where we see this kind of vertebral bodies or cell to uh, uh, kind of molding type of thing or inter, uh, Indian file pattern. So this is a case of lobular carcinoma breast uh, in effusion cytology. Uh, coming to ascites in uh, in 56 female, this is conventional cytology and this is on LPC. We can see this kind of papilleroid clusters and if we can demonstrate some OMA bodies, you can actually report it as serous carcinoma ovary. Again, what else you can do? You can do uh, PAXA, WD1 and P53 and can show, can report uh, ascites as metastatic uh, serous carcinoma high grade coming from tubo ovarian origin. Sometimes P53 is null type and which can be actually uh, complemented with P16. And if P16 shows this kind of block positivity, nuclear as well as cytoplasmic positivity in almost 90% cases, it actually uh, again uh, collaborates with high grade uh, uh, serous carcinoma. In borderline tumors also sometimes we see high cellularity with this kind of papilleroid clusters. The important thing to notice here is low nuclear grade and if you suspect a borderline tumor in a young female with this kind of morphology which looks like an adenocarcinoma on effusion cytology, better to report it as positive for neoplasma on ascites because borderline tumors are uh, not malignant tumors so they should be reported as uh, positive for malignancy. When it comes to pseudomyxoma peritonei, uh, WHO actually says that you should report them into uh, acellar mucin only pseudomyxoma peritonei grade 1, 2 and 3 and grade 1 would be a DPAM kind of thing which is disseminated peritoneal adenomucinosis and now uh, the terminology used is mucinous carcinoma peritonei grade 1 and uh, for uh, the mucinous carcinomas it is mucinous carcinoma peritonei grade 2 and 3. So this would be an example of mucinous carcinoma grade 1 where you have just mesothelial cells, macrophages, lymphocytes and thick mucin. This is MGG and this is M M uh, LBC. So this would be uh, pseudomyxoma peritonei or mucinous carcinoma grade 1 uh, versus grade 2 and 3 where you start seeing malignant cells plus this kind of mucinous material with chicken wire like capillaries and this was mucinous carcinomatosis grade 3 primary was in sig sigmoid colon. Another young male where we had this kind of discrete population of tumor cells and at places it just looked like mesothelial cells but we knew uh, there was a history and there, if you see there is cell in cell morphology the cells are bad looking so this was a sigmatrin cell carcinoma. Coming to some hematolymphoid malignancies, if you suspect hematolymphoid malignancy in effusion, something like this where we have a lot of lymphoglandular bodies, monomorphic type of cells showing cytoplasmic reaculation, better to do uh, flow cytometry in these samples and this, uh, this cell, these cells are positive for CD45, 19, 20, CD10 and CD5 are negative, 23 is negative and kappa lambda shows uh, copper restriction. So it is a mature B-cell lymphoma consistent with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Another uh, pleural effusion where uh, sup uh, superior vena cava uh, cable obstruction was also there, young male um, child and on on uh, effusion you could see CD45 positive cells which were positive for CD3, 2, 5 and CD10. Cytoplasmic CD3 was also positive with this kind of dual positivity for 7 and 8. So 7 and 8 bunch will come in Q2 and they are negative for B markers and so uh, on cell block it was positive for TDT also and TDT here also is uh, showing up uh, some cells so it is consistent with precursor T cell lymphoblastic lymphoma. And this is one rare example of pleural effusion uh, in a case of Hodgkin's lymphoma where the patient was 45 male, known case of Hodgkin's lymphoma and the suspicion came from this excess of eosinophils and then you start hunting these um, Hodgkin type cells and there are in LPC also there are these atypical cells with very high NC ratio and prominent nucleoli. So this was positive for Hodgkin's lymphoma and rarely even myeloma can be seen in rural effusions. So a lot of mitotic figures, basophilic cytoplasm and bad looking cells. 
Uh, we actually came up with unusual malignant uh, pleural effusions, uh, and uh, we can see rare uh, tumors like Wilms tumor positive in uh, pleural effusion. This is uh, an example of germ cell tumor. We've seen dysgerminoma present in ascitic fluid, and this is an example of Burkitt's lymphoma. Uh, coming to mesothelioma, how do you suspect a case of mesothelioma? When you see excess of mesothelial proliferation, known alien population but the mesothelial cells are present as these large groups of mesothelial cells plus degenerated or uh, discrete population of mesothelial cells so when we see large groups of mesothelial cells knobby borders no alien population and discrete population of lot of mesothelial cells you must think of mesothelioma correlate with clinical uh, findings, whether there is uh, this kind of plaque like uh, uh, mass lesion uh, in the lung. Um, MOC31 is negative. So all these are mesothelial cells and that is why they are negative for MOC31. So cal retinin is coming up some in some cells, but when we did D240, all cells were positive. So this was a case of mesothelioma. This is another case where we had more of discrete population of tumor cells, uh, like mesothelial looking cells. We could see these windows in some knobby clusters and there were these larger cells on cell block. Them all were mesothelial cells, but there were many mesothelial cells. Some were small cells, some were larger. And calatinin was cytoplasmic positive, CK was positive. EMA was positive and WT1 also showed up some uh, positivity and um, um, it was nuclear positive. So this was another mesothelioma. So how do you differentiate reactive mesothelial cells from mesothelioma? The important marker is desmin. Desmin is positive in reactive mesothelial cells as opposed to mesothelioma, which is negative. EMA is usually positive in mesotheliomas and P53 GLUT1 is positive. And the best marker here is BAP1. BAP1 laws actually demonstrate uh, this is desmin, which is positive in reactive cells and uh, GLUT1 would be positive in mesotheliomas and uh, BAP would be lost in mesotheliomas and another marker is MTAP, which can be demonstrated in mesotheliomas. So these are the markers. Uh, when it, we compare mesothelioma from adenocarcinomas, mesotheliomas uh, will show uh, positivity for D240, WT1, calretinin and mesothelin as opposed to adenocarcinoma, which would be positive for MOC31 and BIR up to CEA and EMA, which would show cytoplasmic positivity. In addition to that, you can do fluorescent in situ hybridization and uh, we can see this kind of uh, four, uh, four different colors, red, yellow, green and blue. Yellow is like gold and it actually demonstrates chromosome 3, 7, 17 and uh, 9P21 and in benign mesothelial cells, you will see this kind of two signals for each one and in in malignancy, you will see maybe heterologous deletion of P16 with loss of 9P21, like you do not see gold here. So this kind of uh, demonstration, similar to what we do in Eurovision or pancreatic adenocarcinomas, fish can actually help in deciding whether it is mesothelioma. Another thing which can help is um, EMs, uh, electron microscopy. This is uh, electron microscopy of mesothelioma showing irregular nuclei, long microvilli, sometimes this kind of neolumina formation around the nucleolus and desmosomes present within these cells and tonofilaments and demonstrated surrounding the nucleus as well as uh, containing this kind of cytoplasm containing this coarse tonofilaments. So these are the mic ultra um, uh, structural findings of malignant mesothelial cells. So in the end, I would say uh, for effusion cytology, the important thing is to ensure proper sample collection, transport and cytopreparation. Uh, if you are taking fresh samples, process them immediately or within one hour of uh, collection. Otherwise, uh, use anticoagulant for collection. LBC offers advantages both in gynae and non-gynae samples. 
and in effusion cytology it causes cellular concentration specially showed by does that by density gradient in posicellular samples so it removes obscuring elements like mucus and blood in hemorrhagic samples and mucin rich uh, samples you can do special stains and immunocytochemistry on uh, lbc slides cell blocks can be prepared and icc can be done and all molecular studies can be done on lbc slides residual material lbc sediment as well as on cell blocks to determine whether there is any malignancy so uh, with that i would again thank the organizers for giving me uh, the opportunity to um, present this thank you